Good afternoon and welcome to ASE's Guideline Webinar Series. I am Mary Lawson, CME Coordinator for ASE. Today's webinar is titled, Recommendations on the Echocardiographic Assessment of Aortic Stenosis. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items that I would like to go over with you. Since this is a live webinar, you have the opportunity to have your questions answered by the speaker. To ask the speaker a question, use the questions tab on the left-hand side of your screen. Feel free to ask a question at any point during the presentation. However, keep in mind that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We will do our best to ensure that all questions are answered. However, this may not be possible depending upon the number of questions presented. I would also like to point out a feature for those that wish to take notes during the presentation. When, when you click on the Notes tab on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a white text box where you can take notes during today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. Lastly, we will be issuing polling questions throughout the session. When these come up, you will have a limited amount of time to answer the poll in the center of your screen. Simply click the option you wish to vote for. The results will appear on the polling tab on the left-hand side of your player. If you are interested in a PDF copy of the PowerPoint, you can click on the Resources tab on the left-hand side of the player. Simply click on any of the file names to initiate the download. Instructions on how to claim your CME will also be posted here. Also, if you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you can click on the Request Support button in the lower left-hand side of the player, and we will have a technical expert there to help out with whatever problems you may have. Without further delay, let me introduce today's speaker. Dr. Judy Hung is a cardiologist and associate director of echocardiography at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Her educational and research focus is on applying non-invasive imaging to understanding mechanisms of valvular heart disease. She has written extensively on cardiovascular mechanisms of disease and has received research funding from NIH, ASE, and foundations. Dr. Hung was selected to be the ASE Fang Baum Lecturer and has served as Chair of the Scientific Sessions for the American Society of Echocardiography in 2013 and current Chair of the Education Committee of the ASE. It is our honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Hung. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, so uh, my name is Judy Hung and I'm a cardiologist at Mass General Hospital. Um, I had the privilege of co-chairing the recently published guidelines document, Recommendations on the Echocardiographic Assessment of Aortic Valve Stenosis, a focused update. Uh, this was a consensus document uh, resulting from a joint effort from the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging and the American Society of Echocardiography, published um, in April of 2017 in the Journal of American Society of Echo. It's also available on the ASE uh, website. Um, so this webinar will uh, review this focused update with uh, case examples. Uh, there will be opportunity to ask questions, uh, which we will uh, address at the end of this uh, webinar. I have no financial conflicts. So to provide some background, uh, this guideline is actually a focused update on aortic stenosis from the valve stenosis guidelines that were published in 2009, uh, also jointly with the European and American Echo Societies. So this update was specifically focused for uh, aortic stenosis only. So what's new uh, in this update? Well, we review important technical considerations um, in the assessment of aortic stenosis. Uh, we discussed this, the important subgroup of low-flow, low-gradient, severe aortic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction, also low-flow, low-gradient aortic stenosis with preserved ejection fraction. And importantly, we uh, review and present a new classification scheme of severe aortic stenosis guided by gradient flow and LV uh, ejection fraction with less of an emphasis on aortic valve area. And uh, we present an aortic stenosis grading algorithm uh, using this uh, using an integrated step stepwise approach. So let's start with the three criteria that we use to grade aortic stenosis. Uh, we use three Doppler derived criteria for AS. 
Uh, one is the peak AS velocity, or V2, uh, also known as V2. Uh, number two is the mean gradient, mean trans aortic gradient. And we also use the aortic valve area calculated by the continu continuity equation. Now, each uh, criteria has advantages and disadvantages. The peak AS gradient, uh, the advantages are that it's a simple, direct measurement. Um, the limitations that are that you really, it's important to have correct uh, alignment of the Doppler beam, so you really want a nice parallel alignment of the Doppler beam. That's why we strongly recommend that uh, you, get, you uh, get the AS jet in multiple views to get the maximum um, jet uh, recorded. Um, also, uh, AS jets are flow dependent, in other words, they're dependent on the loading conditions. Um, or the hemodynamic state uh, of the patient at the time of recording. Uh, for mean gradient, this, there are similar uh, advantages and disadvantages to units. Um, it, it's, also, it's also a direct measurement. Um, it's also flow dependent. Uh, another advantage of mean gradient is that it is most, this is the measure that's most directly comparable to invasive cath lab um, gradients. Uh, so it's when you're comparing cath lab data with echo data, you want to compare the mean gradients together, not the peaks. And finally, uh, we use uh, the, the aortic valve area calculated by the continuity equation. Um, and that is calculated as your LVOT cross-sectional area times your LVOT uh, TVI, or uh, velocity time integral here, divided by uh, your V2 uh, VTI. Um, the aortic valve area is less flow dependent, but it is also subject to uh, measurement, uh, uh, measurement error uh, given that you're, you're using, there are a lot of variables in the calculation. Um, and this is especially, uh, this, this is true uh, when calculating the LVOT cross-sectional area, which is uh, calculated as essentially pi r squared because it assumes a circular shape for the LVOT, so it's pi times your LVOT diameter divided by two squared. So the, uh, let's focus or, or spend a, a few slides on the uh, LVOT measurement because this by far remains a common place for measurement error, um, and it's, it's important to really focus on this and, and uh, get into the details. So the recommendations are that the LVT, LVOT measurement be performed, one, in the parasternal long axis view in a zoom view, okay? I see many times uh, that, that this is performed in a non-zoom view. Remember, you want to optimize that measurement. So zoom into that LVOT. You want to measure within about five millimeters to up to 10 millimeters from the aortic annular point. Uh, the solid line a uh, solid yellow line shown here. The dotted one is where the aortic annulus is, but uh, we recommend that we do it just, you do it just a little bit apically into the LVOT. I will discuss why that is. And you want to perform it in mid systole. And basically, that's because you want to do it at the same time frame as your LVOT velocity measurement, and that's around mid systole. Okay, so the basis for these recommendations are that, one, you want to measure your LVOT diameter at the same location as your LVOT velocity. Your LVOT velocity profile also should be laminar at this point. Um, and the LVOT diameter measured at the level of the aortic annulus, however, does not always provide that laminar LVOT flow profile because at this level of the aortic annulus, you often already have flow acceleration and turbulence. Um, and this is especially so when you have calcific aortic stenosis with a calcified aortic annulus. However, the guidelines acknowledge that on page 3rd of 381, that there is no general consensus, though, uh, and many laboratories measure the diameter routinely at the aortic annulus level, whereas others measure more apically in the LVOT depending on the flow pattern. In other words, 
they, they look, they bring it into the LVOT as we recommend until you get that laminar flow pattern. And we'll, just, we'll go over an example of that. The important thing is that it's important just to be consistent within patients and ac across labs and, and how you do this. Because oftentimes we're just we're following trends and, and just be consistent with the methodology. Um, additional limitations of the LVT, uh, LVOT area measurements to be aware of are that we assume a circular assumption for the LVOT, but in many instances, the LVOT is actually elliptical. And what this does is it actually underestimates your LVOT area, and then that results in an underestimation of your, of your aortic valve area. So you often get a lower aortic valve area than you, than you may expect given the gradients, for example. And that is probably a source for discrepant indices, the, the, the discrepancy in the three criteria that we use. Other issues with the LVOT area measurement is, you know, how to deal with the asymmetric LV geometry when you have a big uh, upper septal hypertrophy. You know, do you do it here or here? Or, and so that's something that, you know, it, we struggle with uh, on a practical level. Um, we don't definitively tell you how, how to deal with this, but it's just important to try to get it at the level where you will, where you seeing will have your, um, at, where you also measure your LVOT velocity and where you will, where that LVOT velocity is, um, remains laminar. And typically that's not here, but it's just maybe just below, just in this region, just below the aortic annulus. Also, there's issues about aortic, um, oftentimes you'll have LVOT calcification that can falsely make the LVOT um, diameter small, um, too small. And you want to basically sort of angle the uh, calcification out of the way so you open up that LVOT. Okay, on to the LVOT velocity measurement. Um, first, it should be a pulse wave uh, Doppler recording. It should be done in your apical long axis or five uh, chamber view. Your sample volume, again, should be positioned into the LVOT just kind of just below the aortic annulus level to obtain that laminar flow curve. Um, and uh, when, for in, ter in regards to the tracing for, of the time velocity in integral, we recommend that you perform a modal velocity, not the peak peak, but the modal velocity is that it's sort of that middle, the average of that uh, bright uh, line that defines the outer edges of the velocity tracing. So um, uh, here is a suggested way to obtain that optimal LVOT uh, velocity tracing. So. This, um, these numbers correspond to the position of the sample volumes in the, in the apical five chamber view. So first you start off in position one where you're you know, definitely in the mid cavity, you're not, you're not near the LVOT yet. And then you sort of just march down, you know, the second, um, you know, for brevity, I didn't go to do too many um, uh, examples, but so you start off definitely in the mid and then for two, you, you kind of, you feel like this is where you're, Right, right where your LVOT should be, you, you're starting to get that nice laminar pattern, nicely uh, formed um, um, TVI profile. And then you inch it down until you get that turbulent flow, which is shown in three, position three. And at that point, you know you're in the flow, accelerated flow stream of the um, peak AS velocity, uh, either at the valve level or, or in the valve. At that point, and then once you get that level, we you we sort of you, you sort of take that sample volume about five centimeters just back into the LVOT until you get that nice profile again. So that's that's how uh, as one suggestion on how to uh, obtain uh, your LVOT velocity profile. So um, we see that the uh, the, the three. Got criteria for grading aortic stenosis. Um, the uh, the the guidelines. Um, sorry. So the guidelines. Um, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the other one. Uh, you know, we've seen the importance of the LVOT measurements, um, but there are a lot of inherent measurement limitations. 
um, we thus uh, the guidelines presented a, a new grading approach for severe aortic stenosis uh, based on gradients, flow, and LVEF, uh, again, with less of an emphasis on aortic valve area in, in the initial evaluation. And that algorithm is shown here, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes reviewing um, the, this algorithm and then follow with some specific um, case examples. So, uh, first of all, I think it's always important to just look at the valve morphology. Look, look at the valve, uh, either in the, in, the, in the short axis view or, um, and also in the parasternal long axis to confirm that, you know, it's consistent with severe aortic stenosis. Is there a lot of calcium? What, is, there, is the valve opening, what's the valve opening like? I mean, obviously you want to look for uh, decreased uh, uh, valve excursion um, if you, you know, suspect there's severe aortic stenosis. You, you want to make you want to sort of corroborate the valve morphology with your gradient numbers and your aortic valve area numbers. So that's often the first thing that I do as well. Okay, so um, w the first thing to do is essentially assess the velocity and gradient, right? You, unless you, you calculate your um, uh, peak velocity and your or measure your mean gradient. So that's the first thing you do. And uh, then it breaks down into whether you have high gradient aortic stenosis defined as a Vmax of greater than four meters per second um, or mean a gradient of greater than 40 uh, millimeters of mercury or low gradient aortic stenosis, which is less than four meters per second um, or less than 40 millimeters of mercury. So low gradient versus high gradient. Um, and the high gradient is sort of the most straightforward track because it's basically, uh, you know, when the, when the criteria are essentially concordant, right? You have a high peak and a high, um, high uh, mean gradient, um, then you, you have severe aortic stenosis. Um, going, the low gradient track is the more difficult one with a lot more possibilities, and, and that's what we're going to sort of drill down today. Um, if you do have low gradient AS, that's when you want to then assess or um, calculate your aortic valve area. Because if you have um, an aortic valve area that's greater than 1.0 um, uh, centimeters uh, per second, uh, per square, excuse me, um, you essentially then have just moderate AS because all three uh, criteria are consistent with moderate uh, aortic stenosis. It's, it's, there's no criteria that's consistent with severe aortic stenosis. The issue comes when you have um, an aortic valve area that's calculated less than 1.0. And at that point, you know, it's always important to exclude measurement errors. It's, you know, the LVOT, make sure your LVOT diameter is in a good place. You've got the edges correct. Um, your V1 is also nice and crisp. And if your a AVA is in indeed less than 1.0, that's at that point, and um, you want to define or measure the flow status. And what we mean by flow status at that point it, it is basically you calculate the LVOT stroke volume because that will be then your decision tree. Low, that's what we mean by low flow. Low flow is a stroke volume index of less than 35 mils per meter square. That's low flow. Normal flow is stroke volume indexes greater than or equal to 35 mils per meter square. Oh, and okay. So uh, in the event that you have low flow, at that point, you want to look at what your ejection fraction is because we, we, it, the sort of decision tree sort of branches based on the ejection fraction. If you have an abnormal EF, then the next step generally is to obtain a, a dibutamine um, echo, a low-dose dibutamine echo to look for flow reserve or not. If you have a normal EF, then you have that um, what we call low, low flow, low gradient, uh, severe aortic stenosis with preserved ejection fraction. And that's, um, that's an entity that is a better character, has certain uh, clinical uh, remodeling features and can be also better assessed potentially with um, aortic valve uh, calcium. And we'll get, get into... Um, that um, 
pathway of the algorithm. So that's sort of a broad overview. Um, let's now get into some of the cases uh, to sort of demonstrate uh, uh, how we might approach um, uh, using this algorithm. Okay, so the, the first uh, uh, first uh, case I want to show is a is the sort of the most straightforward track, which is again the high gradient track. So if your gradients are you know greater than um, if your V max is greater than four meters per second, and your mean gradient is greater than forty millimeters, then you have high gradient AS. And the thing that you, the only thing you really need to do at this point is because uh, gradients are flow dependent, you want to exclude, is there some high flow state going on? And what we mean by that is it's generally pretty, you know, uh, pretty evident uh, with the patient. You know, is this patient in, uh, you know, uh, have, uh, have anemia, in a thyrotoxicosis state, or, or, or has, has some AV shunt, some reason to have a very high uh, output state? Um, generally, it's going to be... Uh, that you can exclude the high flow state, it's going to be this situation um, so that you, essentially you have those two features, you have severe high gradient aortic stenosis. That's, that's um, relatively straightforward. Uh, this is an example of that uh, shown here. Uh, first, you want to look at that valve. You've got a lot of calcium there. There isn't a lot of uh, ex you know, opening excursion of those leaflets. Um, that's also uh, consistent what you, with what you see from the short axis images of this cell. And um, here your V2 is, uh, in this case, is 4.4 meters per second uh, with a mean gradient of 47. So both indices are concordant, um, consistent with high gradient aortic stenosis. Now, um, I think it's you can certainly get a sense that there's no high output state going on just by looking at your V1. Um, because your V1 is, in this case, 1.1 meters per second, which is essentially within normal limits. So, um, you know, if it was a V1 of 1.6 meters per second, you might consider that there's some hyperdynamic process going on. But this is likely just all a straightforward high gradient severe aortic stenosis just by looking at the gradients and, um, and the velocities. All right, let's go on to case two. So this is a 67-year-old female with a history of COPD and known aortic stenosis and presents with dyspnea. And again, this is a co common situation, you know, a person who has two reasons for dyspnea. Is it the valve or is it the lungs? You know, or is it something else? Um, her exam uh, decreased breath sound. Some expiratory wheezes, uh, she's got the con a murmur consistent with aortic stenosis, and her chest x-ray shows no overt, overt uh, pulmonary edema. And this is her uh, echocardiogram. Okay, so um, show you her LVOT measurement. Um, this is her short axis of the uh, aortic valve. Again, it is calcified, but you know, I see a degree of some opening um, that isn't, you know, it's not a rock pile. It's a, I, I do see some excursion of the um, aortic leaflets. You have a preserved uh, uh, ejection fraction um, there as well. And these are the numbers uh, that we're getting. So, um, you know, V1 calculated 0.9, VTI is 22 centimeters. Your V2 is 51 um your peak gradient, excuse me, is 51 millimeters of mercury with a V2 of 3.58. So under it's that low gradient again, and um, uh, low gradient uh, but severe aortic stenosis by uh, aortic valve area preserves uh, ejection fraction. So what are we dealing with here? Are we, is, it, is it severe AS? Is it moderate AS? Is it that low flow, low gradient AS? Um, uh, and that's, you know, these are sort of very uh, scenarios that we deal with almost on a daily basis. Um, so this is uh, what my first question. Um, 
So question one, what would you do next? Okay, you could uh, recommend a CT to obtain a calcium score. Uh, you could obtain a, a cardiac MRI to assess uh, LV relative wall thickness. Calculate an LVOT stroke volume index. TEE to measure polynometry. Uh, or you could obtain a low-dose dobutamine stress echo. So um, the, uh, what, I, what, we, what I would do next is to calculate your LVOT stroke volume index. Now let's go back to that algorithm here to, to discuss why. So this is the situation that we're dealing with here. We have low flow, low gradient, uh, AS. Your AVA is calculating at less than 1.0. We've excluded the measurement errors, okay? So at this point, um, we want to look at the flow status because that's going to define whether it's that low flow, low gradient, severe AS, or normal flow. And in this case, uh, if it's normal flow, then it's severe AS is unlikely. It's probably just, it's likely just moderate AS with discrepant indices, all right? So let's go through that exercise. So this is the data as shown, okay? So again, AVA was 0.9 with an LVO2 of two. This is your LVO BTI. Um, and the, the stroke volume index is uh, basically calculated as your area of your LVOT times your uh, BTI of your LVOT. So it's simply pi R squared times uh, your uh, 22 in this case. That comes out to 69. And uh, it, we, uh, the in, it's an index number. It's not just an absolute stroke volume. So uh, the, the BSA in this person was 1.65. So 69 over 1.65. I calculate 42, which is greater then 35 um, mils per meter uh, squared, which is that cutoff number. So she's got normal flow. This person has normal flow. Um, and it's, again, it's likely just moderate aortic stenosis with discrepant a, um, aortic valve areas um, and transmitral gradients. Um, as you recall, the aortic valve area can be inherently sort of underestimated just because of um, the issue with the circular assumption that we use for LVOTs. So, um, or, and it's also just, you know, measurement issues. It's, it's, they, they're not always concordant. There's a lot of measurement variation going on. And uh, I think in this case, this is uh, cons most consistent with mod moderate aortic stenosis. Okay. Um, so, uh, at this point, let's uh, get into uh, the um, the subgroup of low flow, low gradient, uh, severe aortic st stenosis. Sorry. Okay. So, um, and that's 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 this pathway here. So we've uh, defined so defined flow status. Um, let me go back. We that previous case was likely in this category where it's unlikely to have severe AS. Now we want to go into this category right here where we, we have a case with, with um, low flow. Um, and in that case, the next thing we want to look at is the ejection fraction because that's how we subgroup this uh, category. Is it abnormal EF or do you have preserved EF? The abnormal EF, the, the, uh, the reason you have low gradients is because you have low poor contractile function um, and you just can't generate um, the high gradients uh, across that valve. With, um, with the right-hand part of this, uh, with preserved ejection fraction, the issue really is more of um, a, is a hypertrophy of the ventricle such that you have low stroke volumes due to a, a smaller LV cavity. So you just can't generate high gradients because you're, you're, you have a small, in general, end diastolic volumes and end systolic volumes. So let's uh, go on to our next case. Um, so uh, this is a 67-year-old female who presents with uh, chest pain and dystonic exertion. Um, 
She's had inconsistent medical care, but was told a while ago that she had a heart murmur of some sort. Um, her exam upon presentation, um, normal tensive, 110 over 60, um, 84 uh, was her heart rate. She had a normal carotid upstroke, and uh, lungs were clear. She had a very, she had a sort of soft 2 over 6 systolic ejection murmur, um, discrete LV um, left ventricular impulse, no pedal edema. Um, and uh, this is her uh, echocardiogram. So again, we want to look at that aortic valve morphology. Um, in this case, I, I, you know, as I said, would the short axis look like it could be severe aortic stenosis? Um, you know, par and this is again real life parasternal long axis. You know, you had the base part moving pretty well, but you know, is there does it sort of is there stenotic more at the tip? So it was a little, it was equivocal. It wasn't was it wasn't really clear. It could have been both ways. And this is her um, ventricle, so a uh, dilated, uh, dysfunctional, severely impaired ventricle, um, ejection fraction calculated out to uh, 26%. Um, in regard to her aortic valve um, indice, you had a um, aortic valve area that calculated out to 0.9 centimeters per uh, square. You had a mean gradient of only 17 and um, a, a peak velocity of only 2.6 meters per second. Um, and in this case, then again, the, what we did is we calculated the LV um, OT stroke volume, and she had a, a stroke volume index of 27 mils per meter squared. So um, this is a summary of our echo findings, which I, I just uh, went over. So she has a low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis with LV dysfunction, with an LVEF less than 50%. So what to do with this patient? So this is my second question um, for polling. All right. Okay. So all uh, good answer. So uh, only one percent wanted to get the CT. Has zero, zero. The MRI is not coming up with anything. Um, Six percent wanted to exclude a high output state. Uh, TE was three percent, and then the majority of you, eighty-seven percent, wanted to go ahead and get that low dose of vitamin stress echo. Um, so let me get back to the slideshow. Okay. And that's also what the guidelines uh, would recommend. So again, we're in this uh, pathway of the algorithm here. This is a situation where we have um, abnormal EF. And in that case, what you want to do is go on to get a, um, a low dose dubinamine stress echocardiography. And what that allows us to do is basically distinguish whether it's pseudo um, severe aortic stenosis, which is basically a um, that you don't really have aortic stenosis, but you just you just have um, a very poor output uh, from your L, from your uh, from your uh, poor LV contractile function. Um, the if with the butamine, you if you have true severe aortic stenosis, then you should uh, be able to augment your LV function. Okay, and then produce increase your gradients and your stroke volumes, uh, and that tells us that uh, that uh, you, you like a, you have true uh, AS. If you don't, you uh, don't uh, improve your gradients or your stroke volume, then it suggests that your LV contractile function um, you no longer have any reserve, and that it's it's, un, it's again it's. The, there's a lot of fibrosis already, and it may be irreversible in terms of uh, improving things. So we'll. Um, uh, this is the uh, protocol that we recommend for low dose dobutamine. Um, you typically can start at 2.5 or 5 um, micrograms per kilo per minute, um, and then uh, we you can increase your dose in increments of uh, 2.5 or 5 mics. Uh, 
uh, every three to five minutes, then you can sort of develop your own protocol. Um, you don't want to go higher than 20 mics per kilogram per minute. So it really is a low dose of glutamine uh, protocol. And the reason for that is it's unclear uh, what um, going um, to higher doses, what that is, what that means, whether it's uh, really uh, projecting that, true, that you have contractile flow reserve. Or um, and it also can be much more non non specific, going higher than uh, 20 mics. So uh, your results are if um, if you have an increase in your aortic valve area or greater than one, if you reach greater than 1.0 uh, centimeters square, then it suggests that you, you don't have severe AS. Um, you do have too severe AS if your jet velocity. Um, is reaches attains greater than four meters per second or greater than you know thirty to forty uh, better forty more specific that's forty millimeters of mercury um, as long as your AVA continues to be lower uh, than one point oh uh, centimeters per um, square again failure to increase stroke volume by um, greater than twenty percent suggests a, a, an absence of contractile reserve. Um, and again, the, our, the guidelines, um, the valvular guidelines suggest uh, that low dose dobutamine is a useful diagnostic tool for this. Uh, it's a two way recommendation uh, to perform an AVR in this subgroup of patients, uh, patients that we're talking about, the symptomatic patients with low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis with reduced EF. Um, and to perform a low dose dobutamine stress echocardiography. So that's what we did. Um, this is a baseline and uh, at 20 mics per kilogram per minute on the right. Um, and you can see the augmentation that's occurred uh, in, in the uh, uh, walls, which again, at least visually or qualitatively suggests that there is uh, indeed a contractile reserve in this patient. But you want to do the numbers um, with the aortic valve indices. So uh, this is peak. So your AVA still was 0 0.8 centimeters per uh, squared. So that's still less than 1.0. And your mean, look at that. Your mean gradient went up to 46 millimeters of mercury. Um, so it greater than 40. And your stroke, stroke volume uh, went to 60 mils. Um, uh, on calculation. So we had an increase of mean gradient to greater than 40 millimeters of mercury at peak stress while your AVA was still less than 1.0 centimeters square. And that's consistent with true severe aortic stenosis. We also had an increase in stroke volume of greater than 20%. It was actually 28% consistent with preserved contractile reserve. Uh, this patient was subsequently uh, referred for um, aortic valve replacement. Okay, let's now go on to case uh, four, our last case uh, of this presentation. Um, so this is a 84-year-old uh, female um, presents with dyspnea on exertion. Her exam uh, shows she's a little hypertensive, 150 over 80. She had normal JVP, um, a 3 over 6. A systolic murmur, murmur with a soft A2, clear lungs, and no pedal edema. This is her parasternal long axis um, view, and I think you can get the sense that there is a calcified aortic valve here with decreased excursion. Um, and notice also you have a very small LV cavity, 34. Um, and uh, with a thick wall, 13 and uh, 14 were, were, was what the walls measured. Um, again, just a short axis. It uh, looks like it could be severe. It's, a, it's awfully calcified. There isn't much excursion going on. And you certainly have sort of preserved ejection fraction um, with a, sort of a smallish cavity even um, visually. These are her aortic uh, valve uh, gradients. Um, again, on the left, you just get the sense of a small hypertrophy ventricle. And her um, peak uh, 
uh, mean, her peak gradient was 39 with a mean gradient of uh, only 22. So um, this is the situation of low gradients uh, with normal uh, LVEF. And when you calculate her stroke volume index, you know, this is her dimensions and the velocity, her stroke volume index was low. 26 mils per um, meter squared, so less than 35. So she has the low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis with normal LV ejection fraction. And this is uh, in our algorithm. This is the situation with uh, that we're dealing with right here. So the hypertrophied heart with a small cavity, small volumes, unable to generate. Uh, a large stroke volume because of that. This is probably the most difficult patient subgroup uh, in terms of uh, management because it's unclear, um, you know, not the diagnosis uh, it can be very difficult, and it's also unclear uh, what to do uh, with these patients. Um, so I think it's important to combine a number of criteria when we're dealing with this um, subgroup. Uh, it's important to look at clinical criteria. You want to make sure your exam is consistent with severe aortic stenosis. Um, you want to make sure you have symptoms that definitely could be explained by AS. And it's typically, again, an, uh, in, uh, an elderly patient that has this entity. Uh, also important to look at uh, some, the imaging data is the LV hypertrophied, um, is there a history of hypertension? Also, uh, studies have shown that the global longitudinal strain is decreased in these patients. Uh, and then the quantitative imaging criteria, again, is, you know, the low flow, low gradient. Uh, and it has to meet all these criteria. Um, and uh, uh, some studies have also uh, shown that uh, calcium scores, uh, the valve calcium scores can be predictive of prognosis in these patients. So you could consider getting a um, uh, aortic valve uh, calcium score um, with um, with uh, these numbers um, being consistent with uh, severe AS or unlikely to be consistent with a uh, severe AS. But again, uh, this with uh, this subgroup, it's uh, always important to exclude measurement errors, uh, whether there's um, a significant hypertension going on as a, a potential um, compounding, confounding factor. And sometimes it's, uh, you also just also have to consider that there is uh, there are inconsistencies between uh, you know the uh, aortic valve area calculations and gradients, uh, especially in that sort of 0.8 to 1.0 zone. And um, you know sometimes again you want to consider that it's just clinically clinically moderate aortic stenosis, even though you have a low uh, a AVA calculation in a patient with a, just a small body size. So in this case, uh, there were features of concentric LV remodeling that went along with it. You did have an LV, decreased LV size um, and high compliance. Um, in this particular patient, she adamantly did not want any intervention whatsoever, uh, including TAVR, so we didn't pursue a, a CT in this case. But these are the things to consider when, you, when you're uh, faced with a, a case like this. So um, to summarize uh, this uh, algorithm approach that, uh, that is in the guidelines, uh, you want to first, you want to assess valve morphology, and then you want to measure your velocity and mean gradient. And then you want to divide it into, is it low or high gradient? If it's low gradient, you go ahead and calculate your aortic valve area. And if it's less than 1.0 centimeters squared, you, then you go on to measure your flow status with, um, by your LVOT stroke volume index with a low flow, meaning less than 35 mils per meter squared. Um, and then if it's low flow, then you look at that your ejection fraction and further subdivide it. Is it, low, is it low EF or is it normal EF? And if it's low EF, then you want to consider the uh, DSE to see uh, 
see if it's true severe AS versus pseudo AS. And finally, I think this is probably the most important one, is that, you know, uh, when we, um, you know, we shouldn't be using uh, these echocardiographic var variables in a vacuum. You know, the diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis in clinical practice should be based on an integrated approach, combining echocardiographic variables with the patient with clinical symptoms. So I, I think we all know that, but it's important to remind ourselves of this. So um, that's it for the uh, uh, didactic portion. I, uh, I think we'll have time uh, for some questions now. Uh, in what con the first question uh, is, uh, in which conditions do we need to assess severity of aortic stenosis by catheterization? Um, good question. Um, I think in this, uh, with the onset of Doppler echocardiography, uh, I would say over 90% of the cases now, uh, severe aortic stenosis is, uh, is performed by um, echocardiography. I think the cases in which you need to uh, corroborate with uh, catheterization is when you have discrepant data, uh, discrepant echocardiographic data with discrepant clinical data. Um, that's often the time when you, when you need uh, when you might want to uh, do a uh, catheterization to to um, get the gradients and, and calculate a aortic valve area. Another situation may be in pressure recovery situations, but again, I, I think pressure recovery in general is not um, not common. It's where you will see it is in the setting of prosthetic valves. Um, and also, or um, small aortic valves, uh, aortic, excuse me, small ascending uh, aortas uh, on a level of less than 30 millimeters. And I guess in, uh, certainly in the adult population, that seems to be less and less common as we deal with more aortic, uh, you know, aneurysms and dilated aortas. Okay. Um, let me just get into uh, some, some, some of the other questions. Okay. Um, uh, another question is, what would be the best view for aortic valve area measurement, LVOT and, and PLAX, polymetry, or VTI? Um, I guess I'm just trying to think. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but uh, best view for AVA measurement? Okay, so if you're talking about... Um, LVOT for the continuity for the LVOT diameter, we we recommend that this be done in a peristernal long axis and please zoom 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 that view and it be done in mid systole. Um, and uh, for polymetry uh, for AVA, uh, we actually don't highly recommend polymetry uh, for aortic valve area calculation. For um, a couple of reasons, one is uh, often you know there's a lot of it's cal we deal with calcific aortic stenosis, so it's sometimes with the calcium and there's a lot of shadowing, so it's really hard to kind of define what that orifice is. The other issue also is um, it's it's hard to know it's it's like mitral stenosis, right? It's hard to know whether you're right at the plane of the narrowest. Um, uh, anatomic orifice. Now, with the advent of biplane, you know that can help you guide uh, that you're get, you know catching um, the narrowest aortic valve uh, orifice. But additionally, um, all the longitudinal outcomes data was based on um, continuity equations. In other words, an effective um, uh, aortic valve area. So that's why we don't recommend high, um, th that we you do an AVA polymetry. Um, for the VTI, we recommend that this be done in the apical five or apical three chamber view. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm just trying to get, uh, can, uh, get through the uh, questions here. Um, so uh, one one question is, uh, let's see, what is your approach to assessing aortic stenosis in the presence of 
subaortic uh, membrane, or uh, hokum. Uh, my approach is to give that to my colleague who's sitting next to me usually. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the class. This is stenosis in series. Um, so, and they, uh, you know, it's un, it's uh, always surprising to me how often they're kind of together. I, I've, I see a lot of subaortic membranes that are in conjunction with valvular aortic stenosis. So, oftentimes, what we'll simp uh, what I'll do is simply report a what I call a trans a LVOT slash aortic gradient. And I don't calculate an aortic valvular in that case because, you know, the LVOT, if you don't have laminar flow, then it's, you can't use the continuity equation. So that, I'll often just report, you know, there is stenosis in series because there's a, there's a, a, a discrete subaortic membrane and valvular aortic stenosis or, or you know, there's a dynamic uh, LVOT obstruction from the presence of um, hokum. Uh, and I'll just simply give a, 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 a gradient that encompasses them both. Um, okay. Um, another question uh, is, can you use uh, V1 from, uh, from the continuous wave Doppler spectral pattern with a double envelope? And uh, what this person is referring to is that, uh, you know, with your continuous wave uh, Doppler, oftentimes you, you, it's, it's a continuous wave beam, so you'll also get your V1 profile, um, you know, within your uh, V2 profile. And I, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to get my V1, uh, if at all possible, using a pulse wave if at all possible, um, because at least with a pulse wave, I can kind of control that the sample volume that I'm getting that V1, it should be in the LVOT area where I'm also measuring my LVOT diameter. Okay, so ideally, pulse wave is what you want to get. However, that's not, for whatever reason, sometimes you can't always get that. You, you're, technically, there's some issues going on. And if you have a nice, crisp V1 envelope that is within that V2, um, and you, you have confidence that it's a, it's a nice uh, parabolic envelope, um, it's 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 reasonable to use if that's all you have. That that's that's been my approach anyway. So, um, okay. Um, Another question is the is the stroke volume index affected by obesity, uh, especially morbid obesity? Um, yeah, I guess you know typically our, the way we index uh, in cardiac chambers has been uh, body surface area, and yes, you know body surface area will be affected by uh, more by, by obesity. It's it's a it's a height and weight calculation, right? It, that's all a, a BSA is. Um, so, but I don't, I don't know of, uh, anything that sort of teases out morbid obesity versus obesity and how, how that is a prognostic effect. We just sort of, um, we don't really factor that in, in into, um, when we index. Okay. Um, so, uh, question here is, uh, I guess I have, uh, I have two minutes. Oh, these are all such good questions. I'm so sorry that I can't get to them all. Um, so uh, I'll just keep going. Sorry. I, the next thing um, we have here is um, uh, one of the questions is, should we calculate stroke volume index at all, um, in all patients or only severe aortic stenosis? The stroke volume index... Uh, Really is a is a subgroup of severe aortic stenosis. So I, I would just reserve it for the aortic stenosis. We have we have plenty of calculations to do already. So um, that, that's what we've been using it. And, and it, when we calculate a an AVA less than one point zero. So um, another question is um, uh, the dimensionless index. Absolutely, the dimensionless index is uh, is utilized. It's it's uh, in in the guidelines. Uh, uh, 0.25 or less is consistent with severe aortic stenosis. It's essentially, uh, but it is essentially just a ratio of your 
V1 over your V2. So it, it's just another way of, of, of looking at um, uh, your velocities. So, um, okay. So. Let me see. Um, um, uh, here's a, a gr another great question, which uh, uh, I'm picking questions that I don't always have the answer to, but uh, but sort of address interesting physiologic issues. So uh, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, and mitral regurgitation. Uh, so, uh, and the question is, what degree of MR would contribute to low flow, low gradient AS? And uh, what uh, and and uh, what this question highlights is how do you address the issue of mitral regurgitation, concomitant mitral regurgitation in, in uh, severe aortic stenosis? Because if you think about it, it the MR, um, so, you know, 40, if you have significant MR, 40% of your um, available ejection volume is now going backwards. It's not going forward. So it's effectively a low flow state. All right, it's a, even if you don't have that hypertrophy ventricle. Um, and I'm not sure the, the question, I'm not sure how, you know, how to uh, deal with that or address that, but I would certainly think that severe mitral regurgitation, you know, regurgitation fractions of the 50% range, um, would, would uh, mimic or give you uh, the same physiologic state as low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, even with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and that is actually, we, we do address that um, uh, in, this, in these guidelines. So I am uh, running over. So, um, so perhaps I'll just do one more question in the, just to respect everyone's time and uh, let me see what. Um, uh, so uh, another another question is um, uh, uh, the issue about indexing um, uh, AVAs. Okay, so the issue with indexing um, aortic valve areas is really they really sh indexing should be applied to basically little people. Um, Small, uh, small uh, folks uh, should have their aortic valve areas uh, indexed. Uh, it, it doesn't really apply as well to very large folks or, or very obese folks. So those are reserved for the, you know, uh, five footers, less than five footers, and very small body weight, because you want to account for for their body size in that case. Um, so that's uh, that's and that's what we recommend for with the um, in the guidelines as well. So, um, you know, I am I am running over, and so I will uh, stop at this point. I, I want to thank everyone for being on. This was a, a huge audience. Uh, I'm really very grateful for the time that you got spent uh, spent listening to me for an hour. And I believe this webinar will be uh, available online at ASE University. Um, and you know, we have talked about. Um, having another live interactive session, um, perhaps in the fall, maybe specifically to address uh, more a question and answer um, type of uh, uh, session as opposed to going through the whole webinar again. Um, and I'll talk to um, the ASC about uh, doing a second session because uh, there were a lot of questions, a lot of great questions. I just don't have the time to answer them all. Does that sound okay with you, Mary and, and Christina? That's absolutely fine. We will put that on our books and, and start to advertise it so people know when they can plan for it. Sounds great. Okay, so I will sign off at this point, correct? Right, right? and I, yes. I want to thank everyone for your participation. I, I really appreciate it. Great. Um, thank you for participating in this afternoon's webinar, and a special thanks to Dr. Hung for presenting on behalf of ASE. As a reminder, the instructions to claim your CME can be downloaded from the resource section in the lower left of the viewer. Thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Have a great evening.